Next on Unsolved Mysteries. The body of a half-nude woman is found alongside a busy highway. Investigating her death takes one reporter into the shadowy world of truckers, prostitutes, and murder. Can dogs save lives with their astonishing sense of smell? Two case histories suggest that they can actually sniff out deadly illnesses. When a woman dies in a fiery car crash, the highway patrol calls it a tragic accident. But her husband finds evidence that it was murder. Detailed memories of the attack on Pearl Harbor have haunted this woman for years. But the battle happened long before she was even born. Is this case evidence of reincarnation? Five cases with strange clues, bizarre twists, and some secrets that you would never expect. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. County, Ohio. The half-nude body of a woman was found behind a truck stop on Interstate 70. She had been beaten to death. All of her jewelry and several pieces of her clothing were missing. Despite a full investigation by local authorities, the victim was never identified. Four years earlier, the body of 23-year-old Shirley Dean Taylor had been found behind a traffic barrier a hundred miles to the north. A known prostitute, Shirley had also been beaten to death. All of Shirley's jewelry and several pieces of clothing had been removed from her body. Two seemingly isolated crimes, four years and a hundred miles apart. Murder cases are often solved when a pattern becomes apparent. And in these highway killings, the pattern was just waiting to be discovered. The man who made the connection wasn't actually looking for it. Reporter Michael Behrens was starting to research a newspaper article about serial killers. I had remembered a statement that an FBI agent had once said that prostitutes make the ideal serial killer victim because they're transient and often their disappearances aren't reported immediately. So I started looking at prostitute deaths all across Ohio, primarily using newspaper stories as the way to track those deaths. Barron's began to cross-reference unsolved murder cases in Ohio. To his surprise, a distinct pattern began to emerge. Eight women in eight different counties had been beaten or strangled to death. Each was found alongside a major interstate. Each was a known or suspected prostitute. All these women who were killed in Ohio also worked at truck stops or were last believed to have been working at a truck stop. And that was the third major factor that started tying these deaths together. Barron's began looking into the little known subculture of Ohio's interstate truck stops. You drive by them and you see these, these restaurants and these trucks, but until you sit there, you don't see what the underbelly, the underworld of these little mini cities that form each night and then break apart each morning and come together. See you next time, sweetie. Yeah, you take care. Barron's discovered a flourishing sex for sale industry at truck stops throughout the state. The prostitutes work off a of CB radio and it's all done anonymously. The, the prostitute will get on the radio and give her handle and some little catchphrase that she's developed as her trademark. And the truck will answer back and say, yeah, this is the Blue Peter built in row three. Come meet me. And she goes off to the truck. And then usually, once she gets in the truck, she'll use the trucker's CB to radio to her next customer. 27-year-old Anna Marie Patterson was the sixth known victim in Ohio. In reviewing the investigation of her murder, Barron's uncovered several possible clues to the killer's identity. 
Hey there, guys. This is uh, Sleeping Beauty. If you're looking for a good time, come back. Anna Marie had been working at a truck stop in Austin Town, just south of Cleveland. Uh, Witnesses guys, said her last call was from a driver of a black or dark blue Peterbilt truck. The man used the CB handle, Dr. No. Hey, how you doing? Sleeping Beauty. How are you doing tonight? Great. Oh, God, it's freezing out there. 25 days later, Anna Marie's body was found alongside Interstate 71, north of Cincinnati. Anna Marie was found about 250 miles from where she was last seen, uh, in a field, in a drainage uh, ditch, in about uh, four to six inches of water. Her head had been bashed in, and she was brutally beaten. She wasn't just killed, she was mutilated, in essence. Anna Marie's autopsy revealed that she had been killed within 48 hours of her disappearance. The condition of her body clearly indicated that the killer had kept it refrigerated for nearly a month. There has been some speculation that some of these victims have been driven many more miles than the actual distance from last seen to found. There may be an indication that the killer is doing something with these victims after death. According to Barron's, the killing spree began nine years earlier with the murder of a woman who has never been identified. Since then, the bodies of seven other victims have been found along interstates in different counties. Each woman had been viciously beaten or strangled to death. Each had jewelry and clothing removed from her body. A newspaper in Columbus, Ohio, ran Michael Barron's shocking story with its compelling evidence that the murders of the eight women were the work of one killer. 10 days later, the Ohio Attorney General and the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association formed a special task force. We were finding that uh, what was happening in one county was not necessarily being told to another county. And a clue in one county that may have meant nothing uh, may have meant a great deal in just the adjacent county. One of the clues in this case suggests a disturbing possibility about the killer's identity. This killer scatters these bodies, and that's the big question, why? There's even been speculation that the killer could be a security guard or even a former police officer who knows enough about police investigative techniques to do that. At least two of the victims were last seen getting into a black or dark blue Peterbilt tractor, possibly pulling a refrigerated trailer. The driver may use the CB handles Dr. No, Stargazer, or Dragon. I'd like to be able to say that we know now whether it's one person and whether it's a serial murder. The truth is that we don't. Uh, and while that is uh, certainly a plausible theory, at this point, it's nothing more than that. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, under hypnosis, a woman has detailed memories of a World War II battle. Even though it was fought before she was born. Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. For those who survived it, the surprise attack was a horrific battle, forever seared into memory. But is it possible that someone who wasn't there can also remember? the day of infamy. There's smoke. <coughs> I don't want it. Those aren't our planes. They're firing at us. We don't have any condition. They're just bombing everybody. The voice you just heard came from a woman under hypnosis. She was born in 1952, 11 years after the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
And yet she remembers the attack in startling detail. Can a living person have the memories of someone who's been dead for more than a decade? It may seem impossible, but that is exactly what this case seems to suggest. The subject of this story has asked to remain anonymous. We'll call her Sharon. She first visited hypnotherapist Frank Baranowski because she wanted help losing weight. Ever been hypnotized before? No. Do you know anything about it at all? No, not really. Under hypnosis, Sharon experienced a terrifying scene of smoke and fire, a recurring nightmare that had plagued her since childhood. Fire. The water's burning. <laughs> all right, Sharon. All right, all right. Relax, relax. Deeper, relax now. Uh, the dream started when I was very small. I always remember having the dreams about fires and explosions. Through hypnosis, Sharon did lose 30 pounds, but the nightmares remained unexplained. Six months later, she visited Hawaii for the first time on a group tour with Frank Baranowski and some of his friends. It was strange when I was there because there were places that I, I went to when I was there that it was like, I've been here before, I've seen this, I knew where things were that I couldn't have known about. Sharon's visit to the battleship Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor triggered the same anxiety as her reoccurring nightmare. She returned to her hotel room and asked Baranowski to hypnotize her. During the session, Sharon began to speak as never before, and a new identity emerged. His name was John Gillespie. I said, when I reach the count of 12, you'll be in the 12th season of your life. And suddenly when she's there, uh, she's talking like a 12 year old. What's your name? John, John Gillespie, I'm a junior. Oh, where are you at? On the farm. What farm? I says, where are you at? She says, what? This is Omaha. Omaha? Yeah, well, Omaha, Nebraska. As the session continued, Sharon related a chilling account of the attack on Pearl Harbor. <coughs> There's bombs dropping everywhere. They're everywhere. This place is weathered bombers with it. <coughs> Sharon mentioned specific names and ranks. Captain Scanlon, Paymaster Cooper, and Ensign Robert Tossack. Don't worry about me. Take a fort. Take a fort and steal the main gun. Tossack was especially prominent in Sharon's account because he was so badly injured. A few minutes later, Sharon's story came to a sudden end. She realized that John Gillespie had been killed. Up to that point, I had not had a past life regression. I wanted to know more about what had happened and, and who the person was that I felt I was in this traumatic experience I'd just had. How about your grandfather? What's his name? Over the next few months, Sharon underwent regressive hypnosis 20 more times. Baranowski recorded the details of each session. Sharon, speaking as John Gillespie, listed the names of nine men serving on his ship, the USS Nevada, as well as Gillespie's serial number. Frank contacted the office of Congressman John Rhodes for help. Morning, Bob Scanlon, senior aide to the congressman, was assigned the case. Have a chair. Thank you. When he first asked for our help and briefed me on the problem, I was pretty skeptical. I thought, you know, we get a lot of strange requests and this has to be one of the strangest. I know it's rather incredible, but she gives me names, dates, and places of people. I have no way of checking. Here. When I heard the story and listened to the tapes, I figured that our office in Washington certainly should be able to get into Naval Archives and either prove or disprove what this young lady had said. Using congressional privileges, Scanlon obtained the ship's roster of officers from the National Archives. Amazingly, eight of the nine men Sharon mentioned were listed. I remember when I received that and first read it, 
I told my secretary, and I don't know whether to point with pride or view with alarm, this was a, a, a strange result that I really didn't expect. The one missing name was Robert Tosek, the man whose injury was so vivid in Sharon's story. Navy records showed him to be in Long Beach, California on the day of the attack. Go, 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 but when go. we contacted Tosek, he confirmed that he was on board the USS Nevada that day. In fact, he had to have his leg amputated as a result of his injuries. However, the name John Gillespie does not appear on any of the ship's rosters. There may be a practical reason for that omission. The Navy admits the only records that they carried were the paymaster's records on board that ship. The fires raged incessantly for two days. All of that was destroyed. Another fire ended any attempt to verify the serial number of John Gillespie. In 1973, flames ravaged the Naval Warehouse in St. Louis, destroying the service records of thousands of seamen from World War II. Uh, how about your grandmother? Sharon's past life memory also included information about John Gillespie's personal life. Under hypnosis, she stated that he was born in 1921 in Omaha, Nebraska. He was the son of John Gillespie Sr., the grandson of Harry Gillespie. In census records from 1899, Frank found what he believes is proof that John Gillespie did exist. When we came across this frame, we found it. Harry Gillespie, wife Ida Mae, son Benjamin, son John, and that John was John Gillespie's father. And he would have been 24 years old when John was born, exactly the right age. How valid are Sharon's so-called past life experiences? At least one expert feels that this is not a case of past life memories. Well, the information about Tosic is easily available to anyone who looks for it in a book that tells a story. The events at Pearl Harbor have probably been as written about as any incident in this century. No, she never did any reading about Pearl Harbor. It was one of those things that she just didn't care for. When somebody would mention, she would just shut around and just walk away. Does he have another name beside Red? Mm -hmm. He asks leading questions of his subjects. He seems to take control of the progression rather than allowing the person involved to be in control and to volunteer information. To refute the suggestion that they had secretly rehearsed their story, both Frank and Sharon took lie detector tests. Glenn Whiteside, a board certified polygraph examiner for 20 years, analyzed the results. In my opinion, Sharon and Frank absolutely are not conducting a hoax. They did not get their information out of records, books. They are not uh, using mind conditioning or hypnotic suggestion. They are not perpetrating a hoax in any way. There is one additional shred of evidence in this case. Under hypnosis, Sharon revealed that John Gillespie had a Hawaiian girlfriend named Sugar. This composite was made from Sharon's description. If you have any information about John Gillespie Jr. from Omaha, Nebraska, or his girlfriend Sugar from Hawaii, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a grisly traffic accident may prove to be arson and a cover-up for a cold-blooded murder. Lawton, Oklahoma. A farmer working his fields noticed smoke rising from a nearby road. He called the authorities and 20 minutes later, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol arrived at the scene. They found a burning car embedded in a deserted bridge. The heat was so intense that the car had actually melted into the metal guardrail. 
when the highway patrol arrived, a body was inside the car at the time. But it was a futile exercise whatsoever to try to get to the occupants in the car due to the, the car had already burned so bad. The body behind a wheel was burned beyond recognition. Skid marks indicated that the car's speed at impact was 50 to 60 miles per hour. To the highway patrol, it seemed like just another senseless accident. A computer check revealed the car belonged to Pat Conway, who lived with his family in Lawton, 15 miles from the crash site. The next day, the victim was identified as Aileen Conway, Pat's wife of 33 years. Authorities reported Aileen Conway's death as an accident, but soon Pat noticed a number of conflicting facts which led him to doubt the official version. He concluded that his wife had been murdered. There's no doubt in my mind it was murder. And if I live to be 100 years old, I'll still be pushing to try to find the individual or possibly two individuals, whoever was involved. Pat first became suspicious when he returned home a few hours after his wife's death. He found the patio door wide open. Aileen's purse, which she always carried with her, had been left behind. Her driver's license and her glasses were inside. An ironing board was set up and the iron left on. Water from a garden hose was running into the backyard swimming pool. In the master bathroom, the tub was still full of water and the phone was off the hook. The uh, thing that really got my attention was the phone being off the hook as though she had attempted to make a phone call, possibly the police department, we have no way of knowing who. Between me and the kids, one would see one thing and one another, and we start putting it together, and, and right away we find out, well, there was no accident at all. There was another disturbing detail that nagged at Pat. What was Aileen doing out on that lonely country road? Neither of them had ever been in the area. Nothing about his wife's death made sense. Pat contacted Ray Anderson, of the district attorney's office. The first impression that I had when I met with Mr. Conway was that of a spouse that was left alone and behind, uh, not expecting uh, the tragedy that happened and looking for an excuse or looking for some reason why this happened other than, than just being an accident. However, when you start looking at the extenuating and surrounding circumstances, the way that she left her house, then it leads you to believe that there is a possibility that there could be foul play. A few days later, Pat and Ray Anderson went to the crash site looking for clues. Pat, could you come over here a minute? Ray found the church bulletin in the grass a considerable distance Maybe. from the bridge. Yeah, this is the church building out of our uh, car from the previous Sunday, and it was uh, on the dash of the car. Aileen always drove with the windows rolled up and the air conditioning turned on. The bulletin could not have flown out of a moving car. The car would have to be stopped. Someone else may have been with her, opened the door, set the accelerator, and slammed it into drive, hoping to run Mrs. Conway off into the creek and make it appear as though it was an accident. As a result of Anderson's investigation, the Lawton District Attorney changed the official cause of death from accidental to unexplained. The DA then asked the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation and the State Fire Marshal to evaluate the possibility of arson. What made me suspicious at first was looking at the photographs and seeing how much burn that was in the vehicle. This thing was completely burnt, destroyed. The burn was similar to that where gasoline or something that like that was used in it. And another thing that brought my curiosity up was the fact that the gas cap was missing. And most arson cases, and this is documented, of a vehicle, the gas cap is removed. Um, and that was the case here. Informal burn tests on dashboard and upholstery samples from a car similar to Aileen's 
suggest the inside of her car may have been doused with gasoline. We took the material and we applied a blowtorch to it, set the material on fire, then removed the blowtorch, and the fire went out, which is consistent with a flame retardant type material. And then we took some gasoline and soaked the material, and then, of course, the thing was completely destroyed. And the point being, without some type of an accelerant like gasoline, the fire would not burn that bad. If Aileen Conway was murdered on that bridge that day, that raises two questions. Who killed her and why? We don't really have an answer for what put her out there. A lot of theories floating around. Perhaps she interrupted a burglary. We backtracked a little bit into the neighborhood, and apparently there had been uh, reports of burglaries in the weeks and months preceding uh, this situation. So the possibility of an interrupted burglary is there. Even though you're discouraged, you, you keep pushing it every day. It's on your mind all the time. But somehow it needs to be solved. I'll never quit as far as trying to solve a case. A reward has been offered in this case. If you have any information about the death of Aileen Conway, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, can a dog really diagnose a deadly illness simply by using its nose? Dogs have been domesticated for thousands of years, and many breeds are prized for their keen sense of smell. Whether finding someone who's lost, tracking a fugitive, or sniffing out explosives, the strength and accuracy of a dog's nose is legendary. If you were to take a gigantic football stadium that NFL teams play in and fill the entire stadium with yellow tennis balls and had one white tennis ball, they can smell the one white tennis ball in an entire stadium. Using this powerful sense of smell, is it possible that a dog can actually diagnose life-threatening illness? You're about to meet two very unusual pets. It may seem hard to believe, but their owners say that they have persuasive evidence that dogs can save lives in mysterious ways. Garberville, California. Hey, got your latte working right now? Nancy Best seemed to have it all. She was the mother of three healthy children and owned a successful coffee shop called the Java Joint. In fact, business was going so well that she had recently opened a Hello. second store. And coffee. Despite Nancy's hectic lifestyle, her yellow lab, Mia, was always coffee? nearby. Nancy had gotten Mia as a puppy. Stay. Mia was the first dog that ran up to me. At the time, I didn't know if I wanted a boy or a girl. Um, until she came up to me and I fell in love with her instantly. Yes, and you were such a good dog. Nancy's mornings were spent running the coffee house. You helped mommy. Oh, thank you. You know, mom's tired. But about one o'clock each afternoon, Nancy set aside time just for herself and Mia. I would drive home and lay on the couch and take a nap before I'd have to pick up my daughter from school uh, so I can recharge my batteries for the rest of the day. And then one afternoon, out of the blue, Mia began to act strangely. She came up and started sniffing and licking at my breast. And um, because she was eight months pregnant, I thought maybe she was kind of wigging out. Um, so I didn't pay any attention to it. I just went and told her to lay down. What do you want? Down. But Mia was persistent. The following evening, as Nancy was struggling to fall asleep, Mia began tugging at the bed covers. She started biting my shirt away like a dog bites fleas, little tiny nibbles, and was trying to pull my shirt away from my, from my body. Enough, enough. I was starting to get upset with her. Out. Desperate for her much needed sleep, Nancy banished Mia to the backyard. <coughs> the following day during Nancy's afternoon break, Mia did the same thing. 
Mia jumped up on my lap while I was sitting up and dove with her nose into my chest. And the force of the pressure of her nose made me rub it because it hurt. And when I rubbed it is when I felt the lump. Nancy was stunned to discover a lump in one of her breasts. I had had a negative breast exam by a physician just four months prior. There was no cancer in my family. I was 39, not old enough for a routine mammogram. So I was thinking this couldn't be cancer, but the, uh, the lump felt very odd. It was quite large. Medical tests showed that Nancy had a cancerous tumor in her breast. A lumpectomy confirmed the worst. She had a stage two invasive ductile carcinoma, a very aggressive form of breast cancer. When I first heard about Nancy Best's case, I talked to an oncologist at the Mayo Clinic about that. And one of the things that we surmised there was that there was a certain smell that was being secreted. The type of tumor that she had in her breast may have had a certain kind of an odor. You have to remember, this kind of breed of dog is actually used for hunting. You know, they have a very sensitive nose. Nancy had a partial mastectomy. Months of chemotherapy and radiation therapy followed. She has been cancer-free ever since. The doctor believes that had this cancer not been detected at this time, within six months it could have entered my lymph nodes and I would have died. If it's possible for a dog to sniff out cancer, are there even more profound life-saving powers that a pet can offer? Darlene Wormeyer of Spokane, Washington says yes. She believes that her dog, Shadow, is a prime example. He was the best medicine that I could have ever taken. If it was in a pill form, he'd be a miracle drug. After Darlene was diagnosed with diabetes, she had a series of medical setbacks. While recovering from open heart surgery, she suffered a stroke. For a while, she lost her ability to speak. After several years of therapy, Darlene recovered her speech, but had a problem with stuttering. At a family reunion, the anxiety of being in a crowd made the stutter even worse. I was so nervous, I couldn't talk again. And this little schnauzer named Maggie came up to me and started licking my hand. I started petting her, she got in my lap. Oh! And I noticed as long as I sat and started petting her, I could talk so much easier. It was phenomenal. So phenomenal that as soon as she returned home, Darlene had to tell her neurologist. He's like, yeah, I, I know about dogs. I know how they can help. There's been lots of studies done. So he wrote a written prescription for a dog. So on doctor's orders, Darlene adopted a schnauzer of her own. Come on, come on, boy. The bond between Darlene and Shadow quickly grew, and Darlene's speech improved. We don't fully understand why dogs um, have such an effect on people. But in Darlene's case, uh, she felt very calmed by the dog, perhaps, you know, paying attention to the animal petting and the sensory effects of that could be actually just putting her more into a meditative trance. Soon after adopting Shadow, Darlene learned what an extraordinary animal he really was. One afternoon, Darlene lay down for a nap and quickly dozed off. But Shadow was alarmed by something and would not allow her to sleep. Mm. Oh. He starts pawing at me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I sat up in the room, just spun. Uncertain why Shadow was so upset, Darlene checked the glucose level of her blood. It was dangerously low. If a diabetic's blood sugar level drops too far, it can trigger unconsciousness or even a coma. Shadow has helped Darlene in, in many different ways, not only in her safety, as far as being able to de detect the low blood sugar, but also it just in her general life. Darlene now is able to walk without a cane. She's able to function and do the things that she wants to do on a daily basis. Darlene Wormeyer and Nancy Best have no doubt 
that they are alive because of the mysterious powers of their dogs. The ability of these dogs to detect a seizure or detect cancer, it's probably equal parts their incredible sense of smell, their incredible ability to, to read body language, and then kind of what I call not just a sixth sense, but a sixth sense. And that's that ability to know when something's just not quite, quite right, and then the ability to draw near to help them. We shouldn't be so amazed that pets are able to do this. We should be amazed on the amount that we don't know that they're able to do. Next, Carla Downing needs your help to find a woman she has met only once in her life, her mother. Alexandria, Virginia. Shortly after their mother died, 16-year-old Carla Downing and her younger brother went to live with their grandparents. Their father was in the army stationed overseas. Shortly after my mother's funeral, a woman came to uh, my grandmother's house where I was living. You know, at that time, I was 16. I had a little bit of money in my pocket. My grandmother was going to turn me loose that day to go do some shopping. $20. Ah. I want you to get me a quart of milk, and you can use the rest for a dress or anything else you Thank want. Thank you. You're welcome. Carla. Oh, Carla. This is Mary. Mary was a friend of your mom's in high school. You look very familiar. I saw you when you were just a little baby. And I do remember thinking, well, gosh, this woman needs to sit down. You know, she just looked kind of, I don't know, shook up or, or something. And, you know, I just kind of assumed that it was over my mother's death. Carla didn't know that she was adopted. So she had no way of knowing that she had just been face to face with her own birth mother. The whole time I was growing up, I always knew that, you know, there was just something not right, mainly because of the difference between my brother and I. He had blue eyes and blonde hair, and it was curly, and, you know, I had straight, dark hair, dark eyes, olive complexion. And it was just obvious to me, even, that we just weren't alike. Carla's family didn't reveal the secret of her birth, even after her mother's death. It wasn't until her father died that Carla would get the first clues about her true origin. Now, Carla, this belonged to your dad, mm -hmm. and he wanted you to have it. All his military papers are in here, and a few more. When I got the briefcase, I just wanted to go over each and every paper, you know, and remember all of the different places that we lived together and that sort of thing. And in the back of my mind, I knew there was something I was looking for. I just knew there was something in there. Carla's suspicions about being different were finally explained. Her mother, Mildred, had suffered a series of miscarriages. And then she met a woman named Mary, who was pregnant and unmarried. An immigrant who barely knew any English, Mary decided that she couldn't keep her baby. She agreed to give the infant to Mildred. The two women made a plan to switch identities What's her name? at the hospital. Her name is Mildred Graham. Okay. She doesn't speak any English. The plan worked, and Mildred was listed on the birth certificate as Carla's mother. The rest of the family was sworn to secrecy. She's beautiful. Beautiful. May I hold her? It's my thinking that this must have really been hard on Mary, because, you know, if that time she felt like she could not uh, have a child for whatever reason, I mean, she was concerned enough that she went to this extreme with my mother to see that I was in a good family. I just have this need to find Mary. I want to be in the same room with someone I resemble. Uh, I, I want my mother. I want somebody that I've been looking for for a long time. And I just hope she's still here. I hope she's got a TV and she's still alive. <laughs> oh, Carla, this is Mary. Mary was a, a friend of your mom's in high school. Hi. You look very familiar. You know, I can remember what she wore, where she sat, 
what I was doing at the time, what I had on, and I really wished I would have paid more attention at that moment. Update. On the night of our broadcast, Carla's long wait came to an end. Her natural mother, Mary Maxwell, was alive and very anxious to see her. Carla was also overjoyed to discover that she had two half-sisters. Carla traveled from her home in Tennessee to Maryland, where she was finally reunited with her mother. <laughs> you know, I see her come. I knew it was her. I couldn't believe it. And all I could say was, Carla, who oh, come? And I ran out the door, and she ran, almost fell out the car, I think. And uh, we couldn't do nothing else but hold each other and cry. <laughs> when I saw her for the first time, I just can't describe that feeling. It's uh, home at last. Oh, uh, I can breathe again. It's just the happiest moment in my whole life, you know. Uh, just the happiest moment in my whole life. This is your grandfather and your grandmother, and this is your grandfather and grandmother when they got married. It's like a miracle. I couldn't believe it. I, could, I couldn't believe it for the longest time. I said, this, this is not happening to us. It only happens to other people that they find somebody they're looking for, not us, but yet it happened to us. When I found out that my mom was alive and healthy and OK, that was just the best news in the world. <laughs> but then the extra bonus was I have two sisters and a nephew. So it's, uh, it's, it's a happy ending. <laughs> it's a fairy tale come true. Several other cases in this program have yet to be solved. If you have any information about them, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. <laughs>